on. Oh, that didn't work. There we go. Sorry. Next page. All right. So we have Ira Perman from the Atwood Foundation, waving and smiling, looking as good as always. Larry Persilli. Did I say your last name correctly? It's close enough. It's fine. Crikey. Okay. Uh, Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism. We have Lisa Demmer from the Rasmussen Foundation. And do we have Megan? I didn't know if I saw that. I don't think so. Okay, Megan's not here. So we get more time with the three that are online, which is really rad. So I am going to turn off screen sharing so that we can actually all be in gallery mode and you can see more faces. I think that's a little bit more meaningful. So if you guys are looking at your Zoom, be sure to put it in that in the upper right hand corner, put it into gallery view and you can see more faces. Cool, let's start with Larry. Larry, what object did you bring today to, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and then the object that embodies this work? Sure, so I'm Larry personally, I'm currently the Atwood, visiting Atwood instructor at the University of Alaska Anchorage and in journalism, public communications and longtime Alaska journalist in many different variations since 1976. Um, and then I did some government work in the in between there. So the object that I brought, and I'll see if I can do this, if people can see it, Woo! is a very old Underwood typewriter. Cool. And the way I look at it, and I have kept this for decades, is, and I, I guess the context, I don't do social media. I don't know how to post something on the web. I've, I'm an anachronism, but I keep thinking when I work with reporters in class and I um, help reporters around the state uh, um, on their stories is, I just keep sort of telling myself if it's not good enough to type, if it's not complete, if it doesn't serve a purpose, I don't care how much electronic HTML, whatever those things are you put in it, it's not news, it's not good. You gotta get it, gotta get it down on paper. You gotta produce a good news story and then dress it up as a podcast, but just start with the basics. So that's the message that I give. To cool, reporters. love it, thank you. That's a good one. Lisa, would you mind introducing yourself and what object you brought? Uh, sure. So Lisa Deemer, and I'm now communications manager at Rasmussen Foundation. Um, before that, I was a journalist for many years, including almost 25 years at Anchorage Daily News. Um, so that's so journalism is really where my heart and soul still lie to this day. Um, I was, I'm traveling, so I didn't bring anything super cool, but I actually had this in my bag because I still take it with me whenever I go someplace, not knowing if I might want it. Um, even though we all have our phones now, right? And our phones do so many things for us. And and so most of you all, if you do, you know, would use your phone or something much fancier, but I just have my my old little recorder. And of course I used to have a cassette tape and and then I finally, you know, got digital and whatever, but I really still love this just a little basic recorder because really what journalists are doing are recording history. You know, often they're doing that in this time that we're in right now, couldn't be, that that couldn't be truer any time than right now. Um, you know, I've just, it's so important, the work and, and, and journalism doesn't exist without, without truth and accuracy. And when I first started using a recorder, because when I was beginning, you know, in my early twenties, way back, you know, we, I didn't have a recorder at all. And then when I started using one, I realized, wow, I was missing a lot of the words they were saying. And um, so that's, that's my thing. I think it's always, it always comes down to, to that as the basics of journalism in whatever form it exists. Also, I do have typewriter envy for Larry's really cool old typewriter. So. Yes, so true. <laughs> cool. Well, um, before I get to uh, introducing Ira, I had failed to also put Elizabeth Arnold on the sheet of our panelists. So we also have Elizabeth Arnold who's been taking this course as well, but she also has a great amount of knowledge to share with us um, with her funding background too. So Elizabeth, would you mind providing some brief, a brief intro and the object that you brought? 
Uh, not at all. Uh, good to see so many friends. And I do have a massive collection of really, really old uh, audio recorders, which I will not bore you all <laughs> with. But my object is the humble screwdriver. But this is no ordinary screwdriver. You know how when you need a Phillips head, all you can find is a flat head. And when you want a flat head, all you can find is a Phillips head. Well, behold, look at this screwdriver. You turn it around and it is a flat head. You turn it around and it is a Phillips head. Okay, what does this have to do with journalism? Well, this man sent me this screwdriver when I was NPR's um, national political correspondent. And he didn't send it to my address at NPR. He sent it to the White House. So it was totally a miracle that it arrived at all. And when I did get it, I, at first I thought it was like a really mean prank, like, you know, screw you or something like that. <laughs> but then when I read the note, I realized he was being nice. And he thanked me for what he called providing useful information about the political landscape as opposed to conventional wisdom. And I know he probably had this ulterior motive like somehow he thought I would maybe market the tool because he actually was the inventor of this thing. But anyway, for me, it's always been a symbol of the kind of reporter that I wanted to be, the, the kind of journalist that I most respect, that you know, the predictions and the punditry really don't really serve much of a purpose except self-promotion and um, you know, the kind of journalist I wanted to be and providing the public with useful information, information they might use on a daily basis in terms of you know, decision-making in their lives. And that's sort of what I value. And this screwdriver to this day reminds me of that. I love that, that is awesome. <laughs> cool, thank you for a rocking object to share. Cool. All right, Ira. Hi, Meredith, and uh, hello everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, I recognize maybe about half the faces and it's nice to get together, uh, even if it's just for Zoom. Um, as you know, I'm the uh, currently I'm the executive director of the Atwood Foundation. Atwood Foundation is a, a private family foundation founded about oh, 60 years ago by Bob and Evangeline Atwood. Bob was the uh, publisher, owner and publisher, and sometimes editor and reporter for the Anchorage Daily Times until it went out of business in 1992. And his wife, Evangeline, was very active in uh, establishing and working with uh, community organizations of that era, roughly from the time they got here in 1935 till the time uh, they both passed away. Um, they left behind a, a, a small fortune and said, uh, use it to fund the kinds of activities, the kind of community building activities that we liked to support. So people always ask us, what are the kinds of activities that you support? And the two big ones are journalism and the arts. A third one would be history and uh, everything else falls into other. But the, the big ones are journalism, because that's a, what Bob did. He was a journalist his whole life, as was Evangeline. And the arts, which is something they believed in a great deal, was a great uh, way to build community, especially in those days of early, earlier Anchorage. So oh, now, did you want me to do my object? Heck yeah, you're not getting off. <laughs> okay, here we go. Ooh. <laughs> some of you have seen this before. Um, this is Bob's magnifying glass. And of course, uh, anybody in journalism knows that this is a, a great symbol of journalism. It stands for uh, looking at things closely, looking at things clearly. Um, and it's one of the very few things we have of, of his collection of memorabilia. But we, we kept this. Um, it, it's gorgeous. Look at this thing. I've never seen one quite like it. Um, but it's a symbol. It's, I, I like that it. it's very clear. This is very clear optical glass. It's not rose colored. It doesn't have any, any blurriness to it at all. Um, and it's just a great symbol, I think, of, for journalism. Ooh, I like this. All right, everybody like the object exercise? I feel like we ought to do it next week, almost, like all of you guys as particip you know, participants in the panel as we wrap up, or in the challenge as we wrap up, almost feel like you guys should all bring an object. This is cool. Thank you. All right, well, panelists, unmute yourself, because we're going to do a real quick lightning round that I didn't tell you we were going to do, but we're doing it fast before we get into questions. So we're going to go in order every time. Unmute yourself and just answer immediate. 
impulse. So Larry, um, Lisa, Ira, Elizabeth, we're going to go in that round. Okay. All right. Larry, dawn or dusk? Dawn or dusk what? Yes, dawn choose. Dusk, choose. Dawn? Okay. Um, dawn? Uh, dawn. Dawn. Dusk. dawn. Lisa? Dusk. 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 Dawn. Elizabeth? Dawn. Did you say dusk? Elizabeth, I wonder if you're- Oh, done, 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 done. Okay, 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 good deal. All right, coffee or tea, Larry? Coffee. Larry, okay, Lisa? Coffee. 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 Oh boy, it must be a journalist thing. Interesting. <laughs> All right, nickname your parents used to call you, Larry. <laughs> oh God. Um, it's a lightning round, Larry, no, lightning. I, they never called me a nickname. They never really didn't. Really didn't, well, we can come no. up Okay, Lisa, just kidding. <laughs> um, Lisa Pizza, but I like the one I have now better, which is LDZ. LDZ, okay, like it, cool. Ira? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay, Elizabeth? Bess. Bess? Bess, as in Bess, you know, Betsy, Bess, Bess Elizabeth. Got it, okay, cool. Um, all right, Alaska, Larry, Alaskan adventure you would recommend to this group? Something you must do because you live in Alaska. Uh, drive to Fairbanks. Mm. Oh, um, mine is the really cool yurts out of Seward, um, maybe Kayak Cove. I think the name is Kayak Cove, but there's another one that's less expensive. That one's kind of spendy, but I would highly recommend staying in a yurt outside of Seward. That was the most fun lately. Okay, good one. Ira? Spend a week in Chivac. <laughs> Ooh. Nice, cool. All right, I'm gonna have to look that one up. I don't even know where Chivac is. Uh, Elizabeth? Uh, spring ski, Arctic to Indian. Ooh, snap, yeah. good ones. Okay, last question. Um, what's something you could eat for a week straight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, cookies. Oh, bless. Yes. All right. <laughs> Lisa. Pasta. Woo. Pasta. I was going to say a tray of lasagna, right? <laughs> okay, good deal. Sometimes you eat a tray of lasagna for a week early. This is I do. This is, this is a fact. <laughs> Elizabeth. Cheese fondue. Woo. Yes. Oh. Okay, cool. So I hope you guys learned something fun because you're reporters. You guys can go look up their, their bios, but let's learn something new, right? All right, so we're gonna get into the questions for the panelists. Um, this time, let's work in the opposite direction. Elizabeth, I'll start with you. Um, maybe, well, actually, you and Larry might be tag teaming this question. Um, but what are the funding priorities of your respective organizations? I know, Ira, you kind of just went into it, but let's um, let's start at the top with that. So, um, Larry, you wanted? Well, so this is the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism. Elizabeth and I are on the board and we're spending mostly Atwood money. Thank you, Ira. Uh, so <laughs> this past year, we had two different kinds of grants. One, uh, we gave out this spring some very quick uh, grants for equipment for newsrooms that were trying to deal with reporting remotely, working from home. Uh, but that was a one-time uh, COVID-related equipment grants or software grants. But ongoing twice a year, we give out grants for projects, in-depth reporting, underreported issues, community news that needs to get out. And that is a February 1 and August 1st application period for those grants. And those are recurring. So I'll let Elizabeth expand on that. I think the, that was weird. Um, I think that um, the, the two things that I w that we really stress or we're looking for anyway, um, in terms of these grants is collaboration and reporting on 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 underreported issues in Alaska, stuff that you're we're we're not getting in the in the regular news feed. And um, I think th those are the two really important. We're trying to add, not just repeat what's already out there. Yeah, great. We actually have some things where we'll be building on the points that you guys just made that relate to other questions. But I first want to give Lisa a chance to, to speak to uh, funding priorities of the Rasmussen Foundation as it relates to media. 
Yeah, our, our funding priorities are, are fairly broad. Our mission is very broad to improve life in Alaska. And our funding really goes around um, things that do that, housing, um, solving homelessness, uh, health care, community development. Um, on our main list of funding, um, journalism doesn't show up, nor does media. I did some searches in our grant system. For journalism, only one shows up, and it's our support uh, with um, the uh, Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism. But we have funded a variety of media projects. So I think we've done more broadly things. Um, we've done documentary films. We've helped with book publications. Um, you know, media is pretty broad too. Like when uh, Molly of Denali, we helped fund like the launch of Molly of Denali, you know, the cartoon on PBS. Um, so a lot of different kinds of things. Partly because I'm there, but also my direct supervisor, um, Angela Cox, also has a real interest and passion for journalism. And so we're hoping to do more. But right now, we have not done a lot in what we would consider classic journalism, though media, more broadly, yes. Yeah, well, that's still relevant to this, this group. I mean, we've got Bo that's on the phone right now. He's down in Juneau. He's trying to look at what are my options for getting documentary work funded. So yeah, you're not just speaking to journalists. You are speaking to people coming yeah. out of a lot of different angles, whether it's their professional life or also their personal passions. So that's helpful. Ira, is there anything else you'd like to add on the funding priorities of Atwood? Just a little more detail on the journalism side. Um, we fund, uh, as Larry and, and Elizabeth have mentioned, uh, the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism, and you've just heard what that does. We also provide funding for the press club, and uh, we, we very much believe in, in the professional field and in continuing to keep it on its toes and uh, trained, et cetera, and to know what the, the, the current, what's going on. Um, we also provide scholarships to the university's School of Journalism and Public Communication. That's another big area of ours. And, just recently, and this might jump into the next category, we just finished digitizing uh, the Anchorage Times archives from 1915 to 1992. So if you can get yourself to one of those terminals at the university or at uh, ABN, you can have access to all these amazing, fun, wonderful pieces of history of, of, of Anchorage. That's awesome, cool. One uh -huh. more thing, too, just yeah. one more thing. Um, I'm glad Lisa's on the phone here, Lisa Deemer, because uh, Rasmussen Foundation and Atwood Foundation were kind of a, an interesting duo. We are definitely related uh, through family. Uh, Evangeline Atwood was uh, Evangeline Rasmussen. Um, and we, we handle the things differently. The Rasmussen Foundation is the big guy. They're, they're, they're the dollar to our nickel, as I like to call it. But uh, they tend to fund uh, largely capital projects and and things of that nature. We do programmatic work. We will actually fund things every year on and on and on and on, which is very unusual for a foundation. We'll, we'll do that. Um, and while generally most of our work is in the Anchorage area, we're fairly Anchorage centric, for journalism though, we take it out broader. We, we go statewide. Perfect, that context is helpful because we do have people that are in Skagway, Dillingham, Nome. We've got some representation from all over the state, Juno. Okay, well, so what I'd like to go into next based on um, really go, throwing this back to you, Larry uh, and Elizabeth, is what are you considering the underreported issues? Like, are there specific things and projects that you would like to see to come to come to light? You know, I think a lot of the journalists have ideas themselves on underreported issues, but they're curious if you have some that are burning discussion items at the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism. Well, I'll say that the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism Board, which has been around now almost a couple of years, has talked quite a uh, bit about underreporting of state finances, state budget issues, resource development. Um, so I, I would say those, though I will also tell you in the two rounds of grants, we really haven't received any applications dealing with those. Mm -hmm. We've gotten good applications. We funded half a dozen different projects, three in the first round in February, and three in the second round in August. But those are some of the issues that have, have come up in discussions. Yeah. Elizabeth, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing things. Yeah, I mean, I think as a, as a journalist, you know when your editor is like, wow, you know, I really want you to do a story about water in the West. And you're like, okay, 
that's going to take me, <laughs> you know, six months to do that well and to do it right. And, you know, I, I'm cranking stuff out on a daily basis here. How can I possibly do that? Mm -hmm. So the story, you know, yeah, we do, you, you all do these budget stories every day, you know, when it's happening, but we're interested in helping reporters who want to take the longer view, have some additional time to do a really in-depth job on a really complex issue. And it's, you just can't do that on a daily basis. And so we're really looking for that. Um, we're really looking for collaboration. I was frankly pretty surprised in the first two rounds of um, grants with, the, with the, the applications because it was a lot of, um, you know, um, a lot of stuff that, that's already out there. It was a lot of um, uh, stories that, uh, that people have already been exploring and uh, there wasn't anything real new out there. And so I, I think we're, we're looking for, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking to help that daily grind journalist with, with or without a, an organization behind you, you know, a freelancer as well, who really wants to take the time to do an explanatory or an investigative series um, with or without collaboration on something of importance to Alaska. And, and the collaboration is outside your own newsroom. So it's the local radio and newspaper working together or some several new, small newspapers or several more small radios in an area, radio stations in an area working together because no one has the capacity in, Generally in Alaska, the newsrooms just aren't that big. So working together makes us a, a stronger project, a better application. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Lisa, you so can, I, can I jump in here? Please. Um, so I didn't, I failed to mention about our funding priorities also are the arts. And that's often how people first think of Rasmussen Foundation because our biggest public event and public um, funding area is our individual artist awards. And we give out these artist awards every year. Um, and we also buy art and support art organizations. And I'll just, I just mentioned that because though that's not one of uh, coverage of arts, isn't one of the pressing issues of our day, it's still important. And as media organizations, traditional journalism has had to scale back and is going more, oftentimes more bread and butter and just keeping your head above water. Arts coverage has really gone by the wayside. So I'm just throwing that out as, um, again, not the bit most pressing, but, I, but it's important. And it's, it's one of our big interest areas um, is supporting the arts. We're a major funder of the Anchorage Museum, pretty much started the museum and, and, and paid for the new wing, um, et cetera. So it's just a big area of ours. And actually I was talking once with the editor of the Juno Empire and he had mentioned he had come to Alaska, I think, to write about the arts only to find that position cut. And, and just, you know, uh, so it's a small area, but I could see even a, you know, small grants for arts coverage would be something that seems like a cool idea to me. Hmm. That's a great idea, Lisa. Yeah. I love it. Thank Meredith, you. Can I jump in? Um, you know, often when, when we use the word investigative, people think of the traditional um, shine the spotlight on places where things are going wrong or scandal or the bad. Um, and, you know, solutions journalism is, is making its way to the fore and, you know, <laughs> shining the spotlight on something that is actually working in Alaska that is scalable and replicable and, you know, that's part of it too. And th that's another thing that you don't get to do on a regular basis as a daily grind journalist, um, looking for things that are working and, and really pursuing them and, and looking into them in, in, a, in a much deeper way. I think we're, we're really interested in that as well. Yeah. An example of that would be, you know, the federal government gave to the state, which gave half a billion dollars to cities, uh, CARES Act funding, and cities all spent it just an amazing um, variation in how that half billion dollars is going out. There's some that didn't work so well, but as Elizabeth said, there's a lot of stories there on unique programs that really worked well. And people have been reporting the controversies, but just haven't had the time I think, or inclination to go look at 
some of the programs that really were very unusual and very successful at getting money directly, immediately to people who needed it. 100%. Could you speak to, there's two, two forks here we have to go explore. Uh, the collaboration. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Can you give examples perhaps of specific projects that were collaborative that you thought were just five out of five, loved how they were executed? Ira, maybe we could start with you because you've seen a lot of projects that have probably been collaborative in nature. Can you share some examples of winners? Well, in, in the area of journalism, we haven't seen enough and that's why we, you know, with, with uh, HJ's uh, direction, are really emphasizing that. And the, the reason for it is obvious, you know, different individual news enterprises don't have the resources on their own to handle uh, doing in-depth work. Um, and to the extent that it's possible to combine two or three different enterprises um, and share those, those resources, share the reporting, for example, uh, put it out over their different platforms, um, that improves the impact, impact of what is done. Impact is a big deal for us. You know, it, it's journalism, it, you know, if it doesn't have an effect, why are we doing it? Um, and impact journalism is why I think all of us are, are there. So I don't know if that quite answered your question, but it's, it's definitely a, a, a something we'd like to see. And I'm just, you know, delighted that HJ is exactly right in the same place on that. Anyone else have anything to add on a specific, potentially even a specific example of a beautiful collaboration of a you know really well executed project? Yeah, you know, sadly, I can't think of one. Although I'm sure they exist. <laughs> oh. This group gonna have to turn that turn that around. Well, I would I would jump in and say two words: urban rural. I think Alaska is the the best place to do have urban rural collaborations, and and to the extent that the Anchorage Daily News has worked with reporters in the bush and to the extent that Alaska public media has been able to do that on bigger stories. Um, I think that's, that's just a perfect example of how a collaboration can really, really work well and save money so that you're not sending your reporters out to the bush. And you, you want to, you want to rely on, on the, the local knowledge that's out there and the people who are covering that stuff on a daily basis and, and work together on a bigger project. Yeah. Totally. And, and I'll just throw out, I think that's perfect, Elizabeth, that example of urban rural is super important, lots that could be done with that. But a good strong example is Anchorage Daily News and ProPublica, um, yeah. uh, um, you know, the lawlessness series, right? I mean, they won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and then the unheard is kind of the follow up to that looking at um, uh, uh, sex crimes and lack of um, you know, official response often to, to those things. So, you know, and they, and I know I've, I've been on, I've listened to a couple of panels with Kyle Hopkins, the ADN reporter on that, talking about it. And he, he really, I mean, it really wouldn't have happened without ProPublica. They had to do that together and it did involve engagement and involved a different approach. That's not the way journalism used to be done. When I started many, three decades plus ago, you know, journalists were so independent and we couldn't, we really weren't like engaging with the community. The communities over here and journalists were over here. And that really is not the best model, but it's the way it used to be. So it's taking really, you know, what stories does the community have to, to share, you know, and, uh, yeah. and how do they want them told and giving them more ownership. The people who came forward, especially in the end, heard about se sexual assault and they printed those individual stories. That was a complete collaboration with the subject of the story. Unlike, usually it'd be like reporter gets the news from the cops and writes it up. And that's like the story on that particular sex crime. But the person who it happened to is never even spoken with. Um, so it's really yeah. a different strategy that was highly effective. 100% agree. Ira? Um, I should mention that the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism is at itself a collaboration. Sure. Uh, That's a great uh, point. It's, it's funded not just by the Atwood Foundation, but by the Rasmussen Foundation as a funder and the Knight Foundation, which is a you know, major national funder. And we're, we'll always be looking for additional funds to bring in and leverage to make, once again, these larger projects happen. 
Absolutely. So what I'd like to go to next, last Wednesday, we had a really vibrant conversation on measuring impact. And since you brought that up, Ira, we're going there. So can you please talk about, I guess, what you're looking for in that front? Like how journalists can do a better job of demonstrating the measurement? Because I think sometimes they get hung up on how to do that. So can you lend some of your philosophy on measuring the impact of journalism? Well, I'll try, you know, I'm sure there are lots of scientific and, and analytic ways to measure uh, impact, but I just use my wife saying, if I, she says, if I don't tell you something three times, you don't learn. <laughs> and, and so once again, this is the collaboration idea. So you have a print media that says, says something, you have the, your online presence on your cell phone, you have it coming on your radio, coming on your TV, eventually it gets in there, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I learn. and. and that's what it takes, that constant uh, over and over, as many different angles on the same general subject, uh, but you're trying to change people's attitudes on something. And that takes constant re repetition and repetition. You can't just do it in one day. Yeah, yep, good one. Um, Larry or Elizabeth, is there anything you can add to Michigan? I'll, I'll let Elizabeth go first. Well, I mean, we don't have a, we don't take the money back, you know, after the fact. So it's really upfront in terms of what you're promising to deliver. And I think what, what you, would, you would be looking for in terms of being able to measure impact upfront is the ability to do some kind of promotion, the ability, put it in your grant that you're gonna use social media to make sure people will see, hear, or um, read what it is that you're, you're proposing for us to, to fund. So can people actually put into their app or into their application like a Facebook ads budget to promote content? You bet. Cool. Great. Yeah. Just curious about that. Yeah, and I know, um, you know, there's metrics, right? You can tell how many people hit on the story or open up the page or clicked or listened or, or whatever. But also, I guess I look at, did the reporting make a difference? Did it change the city council's action? Did it result in more funding to the food bank? Was there any result out of it? And that's not a requirement because not every story is going to have that impact. But to me, I guess that's what I look at. Did it make a, a difference? The best ones do make a difference to somebody's life. Yeah, definitely. Lisa, would you have anything to add to that? No, I think they got it. That's good. Yeah. Cool. Um, so a question that uh, Jenna threw out there, a lot of people on, on, in the Alaska Press Club or that have been participating in this program are actually freelancers. So they're curious how they plug into your programs. Like, do they always need to be partnered with an entity or are they allowed to apply as their own applicant? And I think what I'm hearing is like, you should still be partnering with someone so you have the collaborative nature, but you yourself might be able to be um, eligible, but I'm not sure the specifics of, I mean, we know Rasmussen with your artist award that does go to an individual, but how does that work for the Atwood Foundation? Um, so can you guys go into the specifics of kind of like how to, who is eligible to apply and what actually is the best way to do that? So for the Alaska Center for Journalism, the requirement is um, you can be a freelancer, you just, or um, part of a news organization. If you're a freelancer, we just ask, for a letter of commitment from some organization that in effect says, if this report is done as well as it should be and as well as represented in its quality, we will publish it, we will um, air it, we will put it on the program, we will put it online. So a, I guess, tentative letter from somebody who says this will get published, aired, cool. uh, put on, online. So we ask that, so yeah, we're, it's open to freelancers. We've had applications. We've given grants to freelancers and we'll continue to do so. I mean, it's pretty basic. We have to know that, um, that sounds weird. Are you guys hearing that? A little weird. Um, I think it was just that maybe both of you trying to talk at the same time. I think you're all right. I was just gonna say, it's pretty basic. We, we just have to know that it's gonna have a home. I mean, we, 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 we wanna fund something you know, and if it's a great idea, it will have a home. And it's really not that difficult to get a letter of commitment that is not rock solid, a contract with Alaska Public Media or anybody else, just basically saying, yeah, we're interested in this. And if it comes to fruition, we're, we're interested in publishing it. Yeah, totally. Lisa? 
Um, so our, while our individual artist awards do go to individuals and documentary films, books, all kinds of works are art. It doesn't have to just be visual art. It's all kinds of things there. Um, but our, most of our grants and the kinds of grants that probably journalism organizations would look for um, would be our, probably our small grants, we call them tier ones, but they're 25,000 or under. Um, those, um, you, you have to be a nonprofit. And, and so what some have done is just partner with a nonprofit and the nonprofit might actually not have that much of a role other than being the fiscal sponsor. But that's really important. And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from a filmmaker now, actually he's doing a, a documentary on the Skagway News um, and he keeps looking for funding, but and he, and he partnered with, it was like a great nonprofit, but not Alaska based. Mm. So um, Alaska nonprofit is super important. I mean, Alaska Public Media has been the sponsor for um, some, some short documentaries before. Um, so that's super important. Great. I think that was well heard by the audience because it's things we've been talking about, fiscal sponsorship, et cetera. We've been having those conversations. So that's good. Ira. Good. Um, boy, there's lots of things that we do in journalism. So depending on what you want, I, I guess if you're interested in doing something in journalism in Anchorage, Alaska, you can call me. That's how all of our application process starts. And we actually insist that you do if you haven't applied before. And that will lead me to, you know, one different kind of program or another. If it's a project such as we're talking about here, we're doing in-depth and investigative reporting, I'll refer you to the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism, because that's, that's the mechanism for funding those kinds of programs. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for training opportunities, I'm going to send you over to the press club. Um, if you're looking for education, uh, you know, some money for scholarships, I'll send you to Elizabeth because they've got all the scholarships at the, at the university over there. Um, it, it sort of works like that. It, we tend to fund entities that really know a lot more about journalism than I do. I'm not a journalist, by the way. I should have said that right up the front on this panel. I'm the one that's not a journalist. I mean, follow journalism a lot, but I'm not. So you know, we rely on, you know, Larry and Lisa and Elizabeth and others and like yourselves in the field to uh, make good decisions uh, on our behalf. And that's just how we work. Sometimes we do take on, you know, direct projects. We, we, we've done more of that in the past. We're, you know, uh, but we still will still entertain a direct journalism project. Cool. Very helpful. All right, I'm gonna ask one more question of you guys directly and then everyone else, uh, please prepare your questions because I know some of you have them. So I wanna make sure I'm leaving space for you to ask that uh, even though we had a few others. So uh, if there's one I wanna chat about, it's this. Um, many journalists are fearing like the conflict of in interest to be grant funded, like it would affect their ability to do independent work. So can you speak about how you manage the boundaries that happen between their work and the funding organization. Lisa, you want to take that one first? Yeah, I can start. And we have funded a couple of journalism projects, but not through grants, through contracts. And, right. And, and so that's happened. And I don't know that the boundaries, and I, they were, um, and I haven't actually been directly involved in those, but I would, so, so that's, one thing we've done, but we and our contract usually is with um, the Alaska Community Foundation, which then has like a sub and they're dealing with the journalists and we try to make some kind of a wall there. But the best approach, I think actually is to get to have like, and I don't, this kind of is starting to exist through the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism, but to have a blended funding pool so that it's not just one organization's money and they're giving the grant. And then it's, that's a little, I agree, that's a little challenging. I think that could be hard for journalists. If you've got a pool with a number of funders and then, so then there's no one there controlling that who it's their baby, you know? So that's just one, one thought of that. Maybe we're heading towards that. Grow the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism. That's what I'm hearing. Positive message for you guys. All right, cool. Um, Elizabeth or Larry, you have anything you'd want to add to this? Well, I guess I'll add, we give a grant and then we stay out of it. Mm -hmm. We don't 
metal. We don't try to micromanage. We don't edit. We base it on, this is what you said you're going to do. It looks good to us. Here's half the money. When you're finished, we'll give you the other half. And we don't tell, we don't publicly announce who's getting the grants until they produce the work. Because obviously if um, a newspaper is doing a project or a radio station, we're not going to tell everyone they're doing it till they get the first chance to, to do it. So I guess give them the money and, and not meddle. Sure. That's an interesting strategy, holding that and not sharing who won right away. That's yeah, we're not that. going to tell everyone that you're working on something till you get the chance to publish it or broadcast it first. Right. Yeah, totally. And, and right. I, I have to say, for as a grantor, that's very important to us also. Um, the integrity of journalism is, is important. If you if there's dollars associated with the story, uh, it just colors it. We, we all know that. And so for us, we like the approach of funding the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism. Then we, we're out of there. We, we say, here's the money. You guys are going to make the decisions about where that's going to go. Uh, we don't try to dictate it at all. We don't say, okay, Daily News, you're going to do a story on X. I, I do know from talking to David Hewlin, David Hewlin won't do it <laughs> to his credit. That's very important. Um, and from my board's point of view, we just as soon, you know, let good journalism happen and let the journalists make those decisions and and uh, we just sort of stay out of it. I think that gives it a lot more integrity. Cool. Oh, I'll just add, I mean, no self-respecting journalist is gonna let some organization tell them what to do. Um, we, ha we have internal discussions about this all the time because you can imagine board members are like, boy, I wish, you know, the Anchorage Daily News would do a story about this or whatever. We have no agenda. And in fact, I think Larry and I both pulled back at the beginning of this when you were saying, what kinds of things do, would you fund? Like, I don't want to start naming stories. We don't, we don't want to put a list out, of the, out there that says these are even the areas that we're interested um, in funding because that just, that just, boom, that smacks of editorial presence right there. So I think, I think we're as, as clean and, and, and white as you can possibly be, white meaning like we've got no agenda. <laughs> So I, I don't see the potential for conflict at all there in terms of any journalist who, what, who got, got money from us. Cool. Great. It's a wonderful response. Really helpful. I hope that put to ease some of these maybe lingering fears that aren't rooted in, in truth, but they were just beliefs that needed to be shifted a smidge. So uh, all right, yeah, one thing, Len, Lisa, go for it. Just real quickly. Um, because we have funded, like we did fund, uh, you know, attention on alcohol through, through Recover Alaska Project, and ADN did the State of Intoxication series a few years ago, um, and that so to also to be transparent. So if you want coverage on an issue and you, you know, like there's not enough attention on problems of alcohol in our society, and you want a bigger look at that, a step back, then we're just labeled as funded, funded in some way, you know, and be um, have be transparent that there is a relationship. Um, as a you know, former journalist, I agree with everything Elizabeth and Larry are saying about, you know, stay out. Sometimes we do have our toe in or we're, we do want a certain kind of, of, of subject covered. And so just say, hey, that's, that's the way it was. Yeah, completely makes sense. And maybe one thing I could add real quickly. So the ACEJ has a three member grant review committee. The three members of that committee, the only ones who see the grants, they're the only ones who know who receives the grants until the grant recipient produces the work, it goes public, then everybody knows. Hmm. Very cool. Cool. Well, hey, everyone, and oh, you can unmute yourself because we're a nice small group. So I want you to feel like you can ask the panelists any other questions that you might have as well. So please feel free to do that or throw them in the chat box and I can bring you up because I know we had a lot of other questions, but I want to make sure you're getting any of yours answered. Okay, I've got a question. This is Bo, he's down, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Bo, um, I guess you could call me a freelance filmmaker aspiring to make more uh, documentary style projects. And I pre-apologize because this isn't a very well formulated question, but um, I want to do a project that could uh, on one side be considered journalism, but on the other side be considered a little bit of entertainment as well. I wanna make a documentary film but it wouldn't 
necessarily entirely be just journalism. I think it would actually be something entertaining for people to watch. And for me as a filmmaker, getting all these ideas to get it funded are amazing. You know, like maybe I should focus specifically on Alaska journalism grants, perhaps. But another idea I had was maybe I should reach directly out to manufacturers of the film's topic. Um, I could be I could be more clear on that. I want to make a documentary film about firefighting. There's a very large industry of firefighting manufacturers from the helmets to the shoes to the fire engines. I believe I could get some money from them either through product placement or just putting their logo at the beginning of the film. This film sponsored by Pierce Fire Engines. Would that method of funding, if I did both, potentially disqualify me from Alaska specific journalism grants because then all of a sudden, you know, if we're worried about editorial impact and things like that. So, so is there a line that I need to draw in the sand right now to go one way or the other? You know, would I potentially get in trouble at some point for getting money from a product manufacturer for this film and my Alaska journalism grant finds out about that in the end when they watch the credits and go, hey, we're taking our money back because that wasn't pure journalism or something. I'll jump in on that one. Um, I have to say that uh, film video documentaries are our most difficult ones to deal with for, for various reasons. Um, often the documentarian is not a 501c3, so right off the bat, we got to find a fiscal agent for them. Um, the subject matter, as you said, is can be brought in, in it's parts of it might touch into our mission of you know something, whatever that mission we have or the funder has, and some of it might not. Um, generally speaking, though, we look favorably upon uh, multiple funding streams. We generally don't like to be, probably usually cannot be the only funding uh, enterprise in a, in a project such as you're describing. Um, and generally I've seen projects that have many, many different kinds of funders, whether they're you know foundations, uh, businesses, individuals. Uh, so that's, that really I don't think is gonna be a problem. Um, finding a way to be eligible for funding in the not-for-profit world is, is, you know, is tricky. That's the fiscal agent issue that Lisa was mentioning earlier. Um, but that's workable. It, it's, I hope that's helpful. That was great. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Thank you. Sounds like good news. Uh, uh, Larry, do you want uh, I, I was going to say, you, my guess is we're going to say the same thing. You go first. Yeah, I think, I think, um, in terms of the the specific uh, grants that we're giving ACE, out from ACEJ that are related to journalism, I think that if you were taking money from um, the industry that you're covering, that would be a disqualification. I mean, it's a conflict of interest. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that, and that totally makes sense. So it's almost like I need to look at it from a perspective of which entities, organizations, or or businesses could which category of funding could help fully fund my project? And, yeah. But that's kind of unknown in the beginning. So, so it's almost like seeing who, <laughs> seeing yeah. who can get there first, yeah. you know, it's kind of a tough, a tough thing really. And Bo, not to like, this is all module two. This is all about the funding strategy where you do look at all of the pieces and then we figure out, well, what are the few, the two to five grants and the other funding sources you're gonna focus on, but you gotta look at the whole landscape to be able to get it down to that, that actionable strategy. So everything's fair game right now. And what you just learned from Ira, what you just learned from Elizabeth, like that, that helps you uh, go through this analytical process of arriving at, okay, these are my grants I'm pursuing and this is the strategy of how they fit together and there's no mystery about it. So it lends well to what we're talking about, that like there are unknowns, but as you keep working through it, there comes clarity. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add or should we go to another question? Well, I'll add real quickly, just to yeah. put some numbers on it, ACEJ right now, our maximum grant is $25,000. And of the six grants we've given out, they've all been under 25. Yeah, good to help know the figures. Um, Cool. So yeah, Cody or Julie, Tommy, Victoria. I know Victoria would email me some questions. I'm not sure if I got that one answered or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Jenna. Yeah. Um, for freelancers who are <clears throat> who are losing their voices, who are applying for grants, 
do you prefer that they are attached to a publication and know where it's going to come out or can they find that as they go along or self-publish it I mean I'm a print person from way back but getting into audio so you know a lot of things I'm gonna that I'm trying to do in the future are going to have kind of both components. So would you rather they be attached to a, a publication during the grant, grant process? So you know exactly where they're going to be published. So we, I think we talked about this, we require a letter of commitment. Um, it's basically a letter of commitment from some entity, whether it's, you know, a radio station or a newspaper or an online entity, whatever, that says, yeah, we might consider publishing this. I mean, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't have to be, you know, set in stone. And obviously beforehand, it's really hard for an entity to, to promise, but we just need to know that it's going to have some kind of home. Yep. Sorry, I ran off to the restroom probably. That's okay. The exact moment. <laughs> so I don't have a question. I just want to let everyone know that I am a product of the um, three out of the four, well, probably the fourth actually too. Um, Soul Dominion Notes is started um, about five years ago and our very first um, contributor was the Rasmussen Foundation. Um, they went ahead and placed, um, uh, we were publishing every other month. So they placed six um, um, editions um, that would do this whatever um, ad that they wanted to play. And that gave us the ability to secure um, part of the cost that we would have uh, with both the printing and the um, uh, graphic designer. And then I went around and asked people for um, contributions with, you know, writing pieces or anything that they thought would be beneficial to the Latino community because the problem we had was that there were all these things happening within our community, but there was no way for the people that were not um, English proficient um, to know really what was going on. And so um, from there, we met with Ira and we said, um, well, you know, we're at the, the newspaper is uh, for profit. So we said, you know, how can we uh, tap into some of the funds that you could um, you know, grant to the paper so that we could continue uh, publishing. And we came up with a project that the newspaper would manage and then um, contract to, um, to a nonprofit. So we had a, 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 what is it called? A fiscal sponsor that would contract the newspaper and then the, the newspaper would produce it and then that helped also. And then last year, um, we applied to the um, AC, um, EJ, is that what it is? Um, Alaska Center for Excellence mm -hmm. in Journalism. And we came up with, you know, more of a, a more um, formal plan on what we were going to do and what we we're going to cover. And we got funded. So um, I guess my thing here is that if you really want to um, get a project done, you get creative. You talk to these people here, and then um, you know if if there is a way to make it happen, they will. You know they will do it. Um, with the university, I haven't done very much because um, I'm trying to juggle my my life and and the newspaper. And um, but I do at some point would love to have um, students or you know um, some kind of um, contribution so that I can also publish um, uh, in the in the paper. And I don't know right now if you have any bilingual journalists, but um, that would be you know a real good project that I am more than happy to you know to explore. Great, boom! Like testimonial for the for the panelists. How about it? Nice job, thank you. <laughs> okay, I know you have one more question that I want to get to, but I didn't know if Elizabeth, you had a response or anything that you wanted to say. It kind of looked like you might have. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, um, cool. So uh, one of the things we, one of the questions I want to make sure we hit right though we're on the top of the hour is pet peeves in applications. Things you really just don't like to see. It's just, a, it just really does not work for you. And so can you please speak to some of those so that they can be sure to avoid walking into those landmines? 
I mean, I've got two right off the bat, which yeah. I think are really important when you're applying for anything. And that is read the instructions. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we get the, you know, it says right at the very top, you know, you must be Alaska based or a third of you must, of your people have to be Alaska based. And we get these applications from people in Michigan and they just completely, right? I mean, just basic, you know, we, you know, what, who, we, we need a letter of intent. Where's your letter of intent? Just, just read the instructions. And then secondly, which I think is even more important is we're looking at how you write. If you're, mm -hmm. if it's poorly written, if, if, you know, if you're right, if you're proposing a print project and your, your proposal is riddled with grammar mistakes, you know, we're going to see that. And if you can't tell us what this thing, I and mean, we get these, you know, voluminous yeah. applications. If you can't tell us what your project's about in a paragraph, I mean, then you got a problem in terms of not knowing what your project is about. So yeah, I would say, I would say, read the instructions, you know, great care to, to how you're writing it and, and be able to sell it, you know, in a paragraph or two. And, and I drop. Boom. Yeah, guys, Elizabeth just dropped a bunch of really good advice. Yeah. I hope all and those pieces were picked up. Go for it, Larry. A, a brief response or yeah. seconding her motion. Your news writers, you're running a news story. Make it concise. This isn't like a homework assignment where the more pages, the better grade right. you get. Right. You can't just keep it brief and informative. Leave the adjectives out. Yeah. Beautiful. Ira or Lisa, go for it. Yeah, I echoing that um, clear, concise, compelling. Remember the three C's, be clear, concise, and compelling. Mm -hmm. And I'll go back to what Iris said at the start. For us, it really starts with a phone call. If you think you want to apply for something, call. Um, during the time of COVID, it might take a little longer to get a call back, but, um, but please call um, and, and, get, and find out because then you'll find out, oh, you do need a fiscal partner or no, we don't do that. Um, Ira also said it kind of at the start that Rasmussen Foundation it focuses on capital. That's been very true in the past. We are doing more operational grants now. I mean, we're never going to be the funder of your operation year in, year out, day in, day out. Um, I'll just call out right now. There's a current opportunity. It closes Monday. It's, it could be for operational or capital. So um, go on our website, look look under tier one and you'll see the opportunity um, if you have time to mess with that right now. All righty, awesome, thank you, appreciate that. Good advice, it's funny because I got a direct question and you just actually answered it, nice work. Ira, pet uh, peeves. <laughs> uh, well, same ones, uh, you know, follow the instructions, that's all. <laughs> but pre if you haven't applied to the Atwood Foundation before, our simple instruction is to call us, call me and do it two weeks before the deadline. And uh, that way we can talk about the project and see if it really, if it's a fit or how to make it a better fit, you know, and maybe guide you some other funding sources as well. Uh, we, we do a lot of that sort of work and I'm sure Lisa does too. Uh, you know, what are the other funding opportunities out there? How to design your project to, to work with those. Um, we, wanna, we wanna make projects happen. We wanna make good projects happen. So the, the ones that are least likely to get funded are ones that come, you know, a final finished application from somebody we don't have any relationship with and have never talked to. Very good advice. Hey, hey can I just ask on behalf of the other folks, Lisa, who would people call? Obviously, they're not going to call Diane Kaplan. The name, main number, and then you get in a queue, and then because uh, I am not a grant maker, I'm not a program officer. I'm communications, but one of the grant makers, which is our program officers, they're the ones who actually make the grants. So someone on the program team will call back. You call our main number uh, two nine seven twenty seven hundred, um, and uh, oh, good media impact funders. That's cool. Uh, I just saw that you guys are using that already, but just call our main number 297-2700. You'll probably have to leave a message right now, um, but um, someone will call you back. And if you don't get a call back, just call again and say, this is my second call. But usually, usually it's a pretty quick response for that. Cool. 
Wow, and, and I we're, we're very simple. We have, here's our entire phone system right here. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> my cell phone in my pocket 24 seven. So this is just call me. <laughs> I wonder what Larry's looks like if he's using the typewriter. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just raspy oh, phone. Uh oh. It's, a, it's the tourney dial. All right, cool. Bo, I'm gonna let you look that up online um, so you can get deadlines online. I think you can find that one. Um, but any, cause we, my Swiss heritage says, we're four minutes over 12. Oh my gosh, sorry. I do respect your time. Thank you so much for all of this incredible intellect, uh, great advice that you were able to share with us. If the uh, attendees, if you guys still have questions, please just ping those to me. I'm sure I can go and retrieve them from our panelists or you can go to them directly as we just learned. So yeah, I think that was really helpful. Throw in the chat box, maybe your biggest takeaway so that they can have that as feedback. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think think that's kind of where we can call it. Thank you again with a lot of gratitude for making time on Thanksgiving week to talk to us. Thank you, thank you Meredith, and thanks everybody. Thank you, Larry. Cool. Thank you. Um, right on. Thank you again so much, appreciate it. Nice seeing you, Ira, Lisa, nice to see you as well. Yeah.